I invite Dr. Naushad Forbes to deliver his address, please. Minister, Minister, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning for three reasons. First, the institutes that are behind this event. Uh, the Confederation of Indian Industry is uh, an institution that I had the privilege of being president of last year. And in the course of a very intense but highly satisfying year, I was really convinced of our mission of being one of our country's leading development institutions. Uh, in CI, we work for India's development, and that's what all of us as office bearers try to achieve. The National Institute of Design, particularly the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad, is not only our leading design institute and the one that pioneered design education in the country, but it is a great higher education institute itself, uh, an institute that really stands for excellence in higher education in every respect. And the topic of this program, which is design. Design has long been a passion. It's long been a part of our own company's strategy. It's long been something that I've strongly believed is a part of the future for us as a country. It is indeed, as many of the speakers have said already, the way in which countries progress, companies move up the value chain, and the world gets great products. As you know, great products are and products. Great products are beautiful and functional. They are elegant and simple. They are high quality and accessible to wide, uh, wide swathes of the population. And it is the task of great design to deliver on that end. So not just elegance, but elegance with simplicity, not just beauty, but beauty with functionality, and not just high quality, but high quality with accessibility to all. There are many great things that are happening in design in our country. At NID, within CAI, within IIT Hyderabad, as we heard just now, and indeed, within some of our most progressive governments around the country, which are using design in an explicit and tangible way to improve the lives of their populations. But without question, we have to do a lot more. In particular, our challenge is scaling the many good things that are happening so that we have an impact on the country and 1.3 billion people can see a difference in their lives as a result of what design brings to them. Whether, is, whether what it brings to them is greater products or whether what it brings to them is a better and pleasanter built environment. Let me just give you a few numbers and then I'll talk about this in much more detail in the session right after this inaugural. Uh, but I, got, I was getting some numbers from Pradyumna yesterday. If you look at the total number of designers that we produce as a country every year, we produce around 5,000 designers a year between, between, between 50 and 70 design institutes. We have around 70 design institutes in the country now, uh, but about 50 are actually graduating designs, designers on a year-to-year -year basis. Compare that 5,000 engineer designers that we produce each year with three other numbers. With 1.5 million engineers that we produce every year, so it's a tiny drop in the broader pool of engineers that we produce. And compare that with 25,000 engineers, 25,000 designers each year that South Korea produces each year, a country with a population that is 3% of India's. And compare that with 300,000 designers that China produces each year, a country with a very similar population to ours. So if we really want to scale and have impact, design needs to be much larger as an enterprise. We need to produce many more thousands of designers. Those designers need to be appreciated a lot more, as was just mentioned, in industry, where design must find much greater prominence, and a room like this should have a lot more CEOs sitting in it. 
we should have many more active design firms working around the country, and design should be a part of how we construct our daily lives. So there's much to do, and I look forward over these two days in exploring all those many things that we have to do. But today, we have two things coming up right after this, uh, which I've been looking forward to very much. Immediately after this, we have the Design Excellence Awards, and congratulations in advance to all the winners for the many excellent achievements that will be on display. But also, we look forward to hearing from KTR. I will also say KTR, because he's one of our most forward-looking leaders. He is not only, he's not only one of our most tech-savvy leaders, but I think he has a vision of the future and he's working very hard to deliver that vision for his population and his people. And that actually is the spirit of entrepreneurship. My definition of entrepreneurship is someone who articulates a vision of the future and makes it happen come what may. So I think being able to articulate this vision and then deliver on it is what entrepreneurship is all about. And I think that's what you keep demonstrating. So I look forward to hearing from you very much very soon, right after the awards. Thank you. I think we can, I think we'll get started. So good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's, we were, this session was supposed to run from 11.30 to 12. Um, it's now 12.30. So uh, I'll try and save us 10 minutes of time at least. Uh, from the half an hour. Uh, I don't need to talk to this audience about design's importance, its potential, its ability to contribute to people's lives and to the country. And given that most of you are designers, I'm certainly not going to attempt to talk about how one can do better design. That would be a highly dangerous task. I'll leave that instead to the many great designers who are going to speak to you in the course of this afternoon and tomorrow. But I thought I'd instead reflect on a few questions, and in particular one question which I raised in the inaugural function as well, which is, given design's huge potential, given its huge potential to contribute to the success of our firms, to the lives of our people, how do we scale in the country? How do we, how do we, what are the kinds of things that we should be thinking about to enable design to have the kind of impact in the country that it needs to have, that it must have? And I'll cover very quickly five topics. First is the topic of scale itself. I gave you a couple of numbers, which I'd got from Pradyumna yesterday, and I'll give you some more that I got from him also uh, very soon. Just to give you an idea of the task ahead and what we need to do when it comes to quantity of design and quantity of designers. Second, make some comments around quality of design. Third, the quality of design education. Fourth, how do we raise the priority for design in industry? And fifth, how should we be thinking about design for public purpose? Uh, somewhat related to what uh, Srini Srinivasan was talking about uh, in his session, uh, in his inaugural talk about uh, design cities. So first, the scale issue. Uh, two countries that are good to compare with are South Korea and China. Why? Because they have explicitly tried to apply fairly recently South Korea in the last 30 years or so, and China in the last 10 years, they've very explicitly tried to scale design as a way of achieving many other good objectives. Achieving these objectives of having more successful firms coming out with better products, more proprietary products, uh, trying to improve their public spaces such that people have healthier and better lives, and trying to use design in different aspects of life. Um, they also have a design thinking movement 
but that's, I think, stretching beyond uh, the explicit content of design that we're talking about here. So here are a few numbers for you. So I said the number of designers we produce each year, 5,000 in India, 25,000 in South Korea, 300,000 in China. But here are a few more numbers. If you take South Korea, South Korea has 50 PhD programs in design, 180 master's programs in design, 250 bachelor's programs in design. We now have uh, about 70 design programs in the country, uh, essentially at the bachelor's and master's level. And we have now one design program in one PhD program in design that we've just launched at NID. Even more, if you look at the number of designers that work in industry, in South Korea, there are 23,000 designers who work for design consultancies. But there are 240,000 designers who work for user firms. And we'll come back to this number uh, a little later on when we talk about how do you raise the priority of design in industry because it's the, essential, it's the essential thing that we need to do as well. So just to say that whether you look at the number of design firms, whether you look at the number of designers, whether you look at the number of designers we produce each year, whether we look at the number of firms with qualified designers on their payroll, in all of these areas, we have a massive task ahead of us. We need to scale massively in each of those, and in each of these areas, we need, if you think of it, 10 times what we've got now. That's, in a sense, our immediate challenge. So the question is how. Second area, quality. What is good design? Uh, my friend Jim Adams uh, wrote a book a few years ago called Good Products, Bad Products, and I think it's the best book on design and on quality that I've ever read. And he talks about various aspects of a product or service that make it good or indeed bad. We talked about some of those, some of them earlier on today uh, in also Minister KTR's speech. Uh, you talk about ergonomics of, or human fit as an essential element uh, of good design. Um, I'm, yet to, I'm yet to check into a new hotel where I don't play the game of hunt the switch every night where when you put all the lights off, there's one light that stays on somewhere in the room and you then have to find where that switch is. It's a design problem and it's one that we can directly address. Or indeed, KTR's comment about his phone, he likes his particular model of phone because of the way it feels. Or Raj Sripathi's struggle with the chair on the stage. These are all ergonomic issues. The second thing that Jim talks about is craftsmanship. And he says that craftsmanship, craftsmanship applies to even the most modern products. And you find craftsmanship in abundance if you buy one of Srikant Nivsarkar's furniture items. Um, they're all beautifully crafted, but they're meant to be beautifully crafted. But if you look at the most modern of cars, you'll find that they use an abundance of wood and leather. Why? because they're meant to convey, these are not normally considered to be modern materials. They're materials that have been around for centuries and materials that are associated normally with much more traditional, traditional technologies. Why do we use them in cars? We use them in cars, in the most expensive cars, because they're meant to convey craftsmanship, they're meant to convey uh, a sense of quality. I think one of the greatest tricks that we're missing in the country is an inability to blend modern industry with our craft traditions. We have the richest craft traditions and the most widespread craft traditions of any country anywhere. You just need to move around the country and look at the diversity of experience. And the diversity of experience of people who work with fabric in incredible ways, people who work with wood in incredible ways, people who work with various kinds of metals and metal alloys, and metal alloys that are centuries old in their, in their origin in very imaginative and different ways. And those craft traditions, which are ingrained in communities and ingrained in people who've learned those traditions from 
their fathers and from masters uh, is something that we just ignore in modern industry. And I think it's something we need to figure out how to do. Because if we can find a way in modern industry of actually, of actually bringing in those craft traditions, we will, we will truly enrich our own experiences, but we will enhance our own ability to deliver good quality products and good and well-finished products. I won't cover all of Jim's attributes in the interest of time. I recommend the book very strongly. Um, I'll just mention one last one, which is products that appeal to the emotion. Um, you know, very often when you talk about products, you talk about products in clinical terms. You talk about products in terms of specifications and technical specifications. But what determines whether a product is bought or not is usually something much softer and more emotional. And I'll give you the, my best example, if you like, is the current fight that's going on between Bajaj Auto and Royal Enfield in classic motorcycles. And I recommend that you look at comments that have been made recently by both Rajiv Bajaj and Siddharth Lal about products, about the products that they do. Listen to them talk about the with, with, listen to the passion with which they talk about their particular products. Because the passion with which they talk about the products that they're making, it's got nothing to do with technology. It's got everything to do with emotion. It's got everything to do with conveying and appealing to the emotional response that we have when we see something that is beautif beautiful or when we start a bike and hear a particular sound or all those things that give us, that give us a sense of satisfaction and pleasure from using an object that is beautiful. Yeah? So I think these are all issues to wrestle with as designers. And if we wrestle with these emotional issues, with these ergonomic issues, with issues of symbolism, with issues of what products stand for, I think we will end up delivering better products. Because at the end of the day, good design is not just about artistic creativity. It's about doing something that really makes a difference to the user experience. A last comment on, uh, on quality. Um, all of you, as designers, I'm sure, use computer-aided design tools. They're great tools to enhance the efficiency with which we do design. But I have to give you my bias. I am yet to see one product that I liked that didn't go through several physical prototypes. One product. Um, and it's a constant struggle in our own organization where people show me pictures of products um, and they don't, they don't do anything for me, I have to say. I have to see a physical prototype to be able to relate to it, to feel it, to pick it up, to see how, it, how you play with it. And, you know, we do industrial products. We do things like boilers and steam meters. Uh, you know, but even for those products, a physical prototype, it seems to me, is essential and not only one, but many. So multiple prototypes, alternative prototypes, and doing them again and again and again. As you all know, doing great design is hard work. Um, and sometimes I think the more time we spend on our computers, the less time we spend doing great design. Third point, on quality of design education. Um, again, lots for us to do. We have 70 design institutes in the country. We have less than 70 qualified design faculty in the country. <laughs> I, I'm serious. Count them. Yeah? It says that we need to produce a huge number of qualified, capable design faculty. And that's one of the reasons why in NID we have a strong focus on a PhD program, because we want to actually create the faculty that can go out to the different design institutes and provide that backbone for strong, good quality design education. I'm going to move along, because otherwise, it really, it will take too much time. Fourth topic, priority for design in industry. There are some great examples of companies in India that do a lot with design. Many of you, I imagine, work for those companies, whether it's a company like Titan, 
that entered the market with great design, or Mahendra's and Mahendra, or Tata Motors, or Goodrich and Boyce, or indeed our own firm. They're all companies, or Bajaj Auto, or Royal Enfield. These are all companies that have placed a high priority in design and have built strong capabilities in design that they use as a base for their proprietary technologies, that they use as a base for doing products that their customers like. But we're too few on the ground. We're maybe, I don't know what the number is, but we, it's one of the things, Pradhan, I think that we should do in the India Design Council. We should build a, a base of statistics so that we know how we're moving as a country year on year on year. Because how many Indian firms are truly passionate about design? Um, is it 100? I doubt it's much more than about 100. It's probably 100. Um, they pro and you'll find many great examples of what's being done in those 100 firms, but that's too few. Given the size of the country, given the scale of industry in the country, and given the challenges that we face, we need a thousand firms in the country that are design passion, that are design champions, that are actively competing one with the other on design, exactly as Royal Enfield and Bajaj are doing. Right. So just as they compete in every industry, we need the same kind of sec we need the same kind of fights to take place where firms compete one with the other on the basis of design, because that's how we will indeed deliver great products for our people. Remember that South Korean fact again, right? 25,000 designers working in design consultancies, but 240,000 designers working in user firms. And it's those 240,000 designers working in firms that take the design ideas that they get from the design consultancies and put them to work in their firms and turn them into great products and can indeed, in turn, also act as a market for those design consultancies. So we must see a growth in the design consultancy business in the country. But we need to see many, many more thousands of designers employed by Indian companies, user companies, so that companies start to appreciate design in full in-house. And I think it starts with an aspiration within the company to develop great products. And great, as I mentioned to you, is re great requires that and. It requires that beautiful and functional, elegant and simple, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that and requirement of doing both, of achieving all ends in a particular product. Finally, a couple of comments about design for public purpose. The one thing you can be assured of if you go out onto one of our streets um, is that the street will be vibrant. Unfortunately, vibrant can often also be messy. We suffer as a society from too few attractive public spaces. And whenever we've provided an attractive public space, you see the immediate take up and success of that public space. As an example, take the riverfront development project in Ahmedabad, uh, a project that was done, I think, very imaginatively a few years ago. It's become in the space of 10, it didn't exist 10 years ago, and today it is the place where people in Ahmedabad go just to spend time. And it might be in one of the organized events that take place along the riverfront, but usually it's just to walk in the parks that, are, that, that have been created on either side of the river, or to jog, or whatever. And it's these creations of public spaces where which are attractive and which enable people to congregate that we need in every one of our cities. And it's something that, again, is, I think, our task as designers. How do we influence all the people in every city that we live in to create those public spaces, public spaces available and accessible to everyone in the country and everyone who lives in that city? How do we create those public spaces that are available to people? Because if we don't, we will create our own public spaces. They'll spill out onto the roads. Uh, they'll, they'll get created around good restaurants. Um, and uh, the, public the public space will, in will, will infringe on 
road, on road space and parking space and everything else instead of it being an area which is attractive for us to use. Going with this is a sense of heritage. Uh, we have a tremendous architectural heritage in the country. Uh, you just need to look at the diversity of this heritage. Uh, the temples of Madurai or Belur or Halibad, you look at the Taj Mahal or the Red Fort or the Jamai Masjid, or you look indeed more recently, uh, sorry, not more recently, but you look, or you look at the Dutch Palace in Cochin, or you look at the Town Hall in Bombay, these are all magnificent architectural achievements. Or you look indeed at a colonial heritage, you look at Rashtrapati Bhavan, or you look at North and South Block, or anything, of, anything that Newton's and Baker did in Delhi. These are all a part of our architectural heritage. And these are things that we need to preserve, we need to treasure, we need to expose all of us as designers to, as a way of raising the general consciousness of design and aesthetics in the country. Because if we can actually raise, if we can use our heritage, use the heritage of arts and crafts and architecture that we have in the country, I think we can, in ourselves, create that kind of sensitivity to aesthetics, that sensitivity to what is good in our own, in our own surroundings and in our lives that will enable us to deliver the future that we have to deliver for the country of a truly well-designed, great future. Thank you. Thank you.